Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another video where I talk to Sifi, a good friend, a Muslim missionary who wants to convince us of the truth of Islam, while simultaneously showing us that the Bible is not preserved and not true. Well, he's going to have some issues. In his latest video, Sifi starts off by explaining that his central argument, in effect, is that Allah cannot or will not command the prophets to do immoral acts. Or anyone, I would assume, for that matter. Let's watch the first clip. Why? Because the prophets would never be disgraced in such a way as to be made to be naked in front of other people. It's just not possible. Clearly, this is a sign that the Bible has been corrupted. Alhamdulillah. This is again not my point. My point is that God Almighty commands immorality in the Bible. Instead of trying to bring examples from the Hadith or the Quran, why not explain to us why your God Jesus commanded such immorality? We are all curious. What did God gain from Isaiah being naked for three years? Why was the prophet Isaiah, according to the Bible, humiliated in this manner? Please give us an explanation. Now, I think Sifi has made a big error here. Like, I don't know how he's missed this. Maybe he woke up on the wrong side of the bed whenever he recorded this video. But actually, it is a defense if God orders acts. Because God, by definition, as we both agree as theists, as Christians, and as Muslims, and as Jews, that God is the most perfect being. Therefore, necessarily, he is omnipotent. He can do all things that are logically possible. He is omniscient. He knows all things that there is to know. And he is omnibenevolent. He is morally perfect. If God is morally perfect, or Allah as you would call him, then necessarily, if he commands anything, then that thing in and of itself is morally justifiable and is not morally bad or immoral. So the challenge isn't for me to show you somewhere where Allah tells his prophets to do something bad because Allah supposedly in both our views isn't bad and cannot do that and would not do that. So if you tell someone to do it, it's justified, morally speaking, or warranted, as we would might say. The challenge actually to me would be to show you somewhere where a prophet does something, like Muhammad, where he is not told to do it. That's actually the challenge. Because that would demonstrate that there is a high likelihood that Muhammad is acting of his own will and not the will of Allah, who supposedly sent him as a prophet. Hmm, I wonder where I can find places where Muhammad does questionable moral acts, but there's no actual corresponding source material from either the Quran or the Hadith that says it's justifiable. Well, we got, we, we got quite a lot we can go through here, Sifi. I hope you have a lot of time on your hands. I'm going to try and condense this as, as concise and as few as I possibly can. But let's start off with the hadith that say that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old Aisha when he consummated the marriage with her, when he was 53 or 54 or so. Let's start off with Sahih al-Bukhari 3896, and we read. So this is in the chapter of marriage of the Prophet with Aisha. Khadija died, that was his first wife, three years before the Prophet departed to Medina. He stayed there for two years or so, and then he married Aisha when she was a girl of six years of age. And then he consumed that marriage when she was nine years old. So Muhammad had sexual relations with a girl of nine years of age. We know that girls at the age of nine have not completed puberty in any sense. It's questionable if she's even started puberty, given the diet of the area. And we know that diet is one of the leading factors of bringing about puberty earlier. If you have a good diet, it's more likely you will start puberty earlier. In Mecca, which is not known for being a particularly fertile land, she would not have had a good diet, and hence she wouldn't have had early puberty. Then we read another hadith, Sahih al-Bukhari 5133. We read in the chapter, giving one's young children in marriage. Again, the context here is the age of six when she was betrothed, and nine when the marriage was consummated. Narrated Aisha, so this is Aisha herself speaking, the Prophet married her when she was six years old, and he consummated his marriage when she was nine years old. Then she remained with him for nine years till his death. And I'll read one more for good measure. There are a ton of these, but we have to be quick. In the chapter, Consummation of Marriage with a Girl of Nine, in Sunan and Nasai 3378, we read, It was narrated that Aisha said, The Messenger of Allah married me when I was six, and consummated the marriage with me when I was nine, and I used to play with dolls. Now that's significant because playing with dolls is something that is haram, it is forbidden, unless you're a child. Once you reach the age of accountability, you are not meant to be playing with things with images on them, which dolls would include. So she is not yet an adult. We know that because she was nine, and obviously a nine is not an adult. And we also know that because she's playing with dolls at the time that the marriage was consummated. Bro, it's not looking good. It's, re it's really not looking good. I'm just, just being honest with you here. To my knowledge, and I'm, by all means, Sifi, if you can find this, I'd love to be corrected. 
there isn't anything in your source material that tells you that Muhammad was told by Allah to consummate the marriage with Aisha when she was nine. I would be really interesting if you can find that for me, Sifi. But I'm pretty sure that doesn't exist. I'm pretty sure that actually Muhammad acted of his own will here. This isn't from Allah. This is Muhammad choosing to have sex with a nine-year-old. Anyway, you can see how I've made my point that actually prophets doing things without being told actually makes it worse because it implies that they were acting on their own behalf of their own interests. You could make a case, although it's challenging, as many things are, that God in his infinite knowledge and wisdom could have allowed such a thing because perhaps it would bring about something greater in the future. Again, I find that um, challenging in the context of having sex with a nine-year-old. But I guess it is possible, technically. We would at least plead agnostic about it. But again, Muhammad never had that. He just acted of his own will. It gets a little more difficult, Sifi. Sorry to tell you this. So the verse of Surah Al-Talaq, Ayah 4, Surah 65, Ayah 4, in which it is explained that one of the edge cases to the idda, the waiting period, of roughly three monthly cycles that you're supposed to wait when you divorce a woman in Islam. One of the edge cases is what happens when the woman doesn't have monthly cycles. For example, she's pregnant. Or, for example, she's hit menopause. She no longer menstruates. She's too old. Or, as the Quran says, those who have not yet menstruated. Let's have a look at the tafsirs on who that means. So we read in Tafsir Ibn Abbas, supposedly, because it's questionable if he is actually from Ibn Tabas, but anyway. Upon which another man asked, O Messenger of Allah, what about the waiting period of those who do not have menstruation? Because they are too young. They are too young. Uh huh. In fact, it, it then continues, along with those who have it not because of young age. The answer from the Quran is you just wait three months rather than three monthly cycles because they don't have monthly cycles because they haven't hit menstruation yet. Let's read Al Jalalain, the two Jalals. Let's see what they say. As for those of your women, who no longer expect to menstruate, they're too old. If you have any doubts about their waiting period, their prescribed waiting period should be three months. And also for those who have not yet menstruated, because of their young age, their period should also be three months. What this is telling us is that it's permissible to divorce someone who has not actually started puberty yet. In Islam, it is permissible for you, because it is ordained in the Quran, to have sex with those who are too young to have reached menstruation. Let's read Ibn Kathir, see what he says. Uh, it is three months instead of the three monthly cycles for those who menstruate, which is based upon the ayah and C2228, which gives the general rule of it's just three monthly cycles generally, right? The same for the young who have not reached the years of menstruation. Their idda is three months, like those in menopause. So what do you do if you're divorcing a woman who has not begun menstruating yet because she's too young? Well, instead of waiting three monthly cycles, you just wait three months. This would have been a perfect time to condemn this behavior in the Quran, by the way, and say that actually having sex with premenstrual children is haram. But the Quran doesn't say that. It instead, gives criteria to which this can be done in a lawful way. And I'm just going to read one more um, I'm going to read Madudi, who's a modern scholar. So, what does he say? They may not have menstruated as yet, either because of young age or delayed menstrual discharge, as it happens in case of some women, or because of no discharge at all throughout life, which, though rare, may also be the case. In any case, the waiting period of such women is the same as that of the woman who has stopped menstruating. That is three months from the time divorce was pronounced. Here, one should bear in mind the fact that according to the explanations given in the Quran, the question of the waiting period arises in respect of the woman who, with whom marriage may have been consummated. For there is no waiting period in case divorce is pronounced before the consummation of marriage. Therefore, making mention of the waiting period for the girls who have not yet menstruated clearly proves that, that it is not only permissible to give away the girl in marriage at this age, but it is also permissible for the husband to consummate marriage with her. Now, obviously no Muslim has the right to forbid a thing that the Quran has held as permissible. Keep that in mind, Sifi. No Muslim has the right to forbid something that Allah has explicitly made permissible in the Quran. Now you could respond to this, like quite intelligently, I think, and you could say, well, you said that if Allah ordains something, then necessarily it cannot be immoral. Right, I agree with that. But here's the question, though. When was this verse revealed? According to the traditional standard ordering, or the Egyptian standard ordering, Surah 65, or Surah Al-Talaq, was revealed in the Medinan period. So when did Muhammad marry Aisha? Well, we know that Surah Al-Talaq, Ayah 65, was revealed in the Medinan period. The question then is exactly when was it revealed? Well, we know that this is in response to edge cases about the idda, the waiting period, about those who have not 
got menstrual cycles. So this must have come after Surah Al-Baqarah, the particular verses that deals with the general case for the Idda, it must have come after those verses were revealed. So we can base the dating on Surah Al-Talaq 65 after Surah Al-Baqarah. When was Surah Al-Baqarah revealed? Well, it looks like a general consensus seems to be pointing towards 622. Right, so it looks like it might have been around 623 or 623 onwards for Surah Al-Talaq being revealed. Well, it's Surah Al-Talaq that gives Muhammad the general permission from Allah to consummate the marriage with those who have not yet menstruated. That's a dangerously close timeline where it looks as if Muhammad is acting before he gets revelation. In other words, what gave him the permission to do this and to make it permissible for him to consummate the marriage when she was only nine, if it looks unlikely that Surah Al-Talaq was revealed at that time. If we say that Aisha was born in 614, and then in 620 she was six years old, so she gave consent to the marriage contract somehow, and then three years later, so 623, it's consummated. One could very much make the argument that either this happened before the revelation came down, or that it happens in conjunction with the revelation coming down, and Muhammad is using this to justify his own actions. In other words, Muhammad consummated with Aisha, the nine-year-old child, at the same time he revealed a verse that said it was permissible for him to do that. That sounds more like the Quran is a making of Muhammad than anything that came from God. It seems quite clear to me that this is a un, an unsanctioned uh, act that Muhammad did. That is uh, naughty, naughty, very bad, very, very, very bad. But wait, there might be a way you can kind of get out of this. There is a hadith that talks about how Muhammad saw Aisha in a dream from Tahir al-Bukhari 7012. Narrated Aisha, Allah's messenger said to me, You were shown to me twice in a dream before I married you. I saw an angel carrying you in a silken piece of cloth. And I said to him, Uncover her. And behold, it was you. I said to myself, If this is from Allah, then it must happen. Then you were shown to me, the angel carrying you in a silken piece of cloth. And I said to him, uncover her, and behold, it was you. And I said to you, if this is from Allah, then it must happen. So it looks like maybe Allah did give the command for this to happen, for Muhammad to have consummation with nine-year-old Aisha. But there's a problem, though. Consummation is never mentioned here. And it's also never mentioned that he has to do it when she's nine. It merely says that at some point in the future, Muhammad will marry her. So why didn't he just wait? He could have just waited, but he didn't wait. He chose to do it when she was nine, while she was still playing with dolls and had not yet <laughs> hit her menstrual cycle or completed puberty in any standard. In fact, it's questionable if she even started puberty. So that doesn't help. The next point I want to come back to in his video that he made to me was when he said that they don't believe the prophets are sinless in the sense that I'm thinking about, but rather they think the prophets are sinless in the sense that they don't commit major sins only minor sins. And I don't mean minor in that sense, I mean minor, like um, like lesser, not child. <clears throat> I present my challenge to Sifi. Show me anywhere in the Quran or the Hadith or the Sunnah in general where it tells you that Muhammad and the prophets can only do minor sins and not major sins. And then tell me where the distinction is between those two, either in the Quran or valid Hadith. You will not find it because the idea that the prophets committed minor and major sins as a distinction is bidder. It is an innovation that came much later in your religion. It is not something that the Salaf would have been familiar with. After all, the Quran makes it clear. Muhammad had his past, present and future sins forgiven in Surah 48, Ayah 2. Keep in mind that in Sahih Abu Qari 4476, where it makes absolutely clear that the prophets did indeed commit sins. Very simple. Let's read. So go to Moses, the slave to whom Allah spoke directly to and gave him the Torah. So they will go to him and he will say, I am not fit for this undertaking. I wonder why that is, Moses. And he will mention his killing a person who was not a killer. And so he will feel ashamed, therefore, before his Lord. And he will say, go to Jesus, Allah's slave, his apostle and Allah's word, Jesus is Allah's word, and a spirit coming from him. Now here's what's interesting, read this. Jesus will say, I am not fit for this undertaking, go to Muhammad, the slave of Allah, whose past and future sins were forgiven by Allah. Now what's weird is, Jesus says he's unfit for this, but he never explains why. This hadith is full of different prophets given reasons as to why they are not fit for this undertaking. Noah gives a reason, Abraham gives a reason, Adam gives a reason. I mean, Adam explicitly even calls it a sin. And I mean, Adam did disobey God directly and obeyed Satan instead. Think that might be a major sin, Sifi? Just, just going to point that out there. If you think Adam was a prophet and he uh, directly disobeyed Allah and he directly followed the command of Satan, might be a major sin. I'm, I'm not a scholar, but I think it might be. Check that one out. Likewise, when Muhammad explains his past and future sins were forgiven, I don't think all of them were minor. 
Pun intended. Evidently, Moses killing someone who had not killed is a sin. Again, to remind you, Christians, we think Moses made mistakes and sinned. We think he wasn't sinless. Because you think that the prophets are sinless, you have problems when your own sources tell you that they weren't. I mean, this is like not even going into the whole issue of you guys affirm the Torah and the Injil and the Torah and the Injil explicitly say these things. But, you know, knowing that whole kettle of fish, mm -hmm. just looking at the Quran sources alone, it's clear that, yes, the early Muslims did believe that the prophets sinned. And yes, that includes major sins like killing when the other person has not killed. It also includes telling lies because Abraham told lies. Remember? Although, to be fair, Muhammad does say there are situations where it's permissible to lie, but Abraham does not fall into the categories he gives, like lying to your own wife to make her happy. Or wives, because you can have up to four. Let's continue. In Sahih al Bukhari 278, narrated Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, The people of Bani Israel used to take bath, used to take bath, used to take baths naked altogether, looking at each other. The Prophet Moses used to take a bath alone. They said, by Allah, nothing prevents Moses from taking a bath with us, except that he has a scrotal hernia. So once Moses went out to take a bath and put his clothes over a stone, and then that stone ran away with his clothes. Hmm. Yeah, I'm starting to notice a problem here. Moses followed that stone saying, my clothes, O stone, my clothes, O stone. So the people of Bani Israel saw him and said, by Allah, Moses has got no defect in his body. Moses took his clothes and began to beat the stone. He's now beating a stone with his own clothes while naked. Okay. Abu Huraira added, By Allah, there are still six or seven marks present on the stone from that excessive beating. So now Sifi's going through the hadith material that I brought up that is very authentic that talks about Muhammad being naked in front of other people and talks about Musa running after a stone while being naked in front of the people of Bani Israel. Let's go through his points, because um, there's a few issues with them. <laughs> let's, let's, let's take a look. Number one, nowhere did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command Moses alayhi salam to walk naked in front of the people. What I find bizarre is you quote the Quran, Surah 33, Ayah 69. But Moses alayhi salam was proven innocent from their accusations because of this encounter. Oh, you have believed. Be not like those who abused Moses. Then Allah cleared him of what they said, and he in the sight of Allah was distinguished. I'm not sure why you quoted that, given that that kind of proves my point. I mean, the, the verse itself says, Oh, you have believed. Be not like those who abused Moses. Then Allah cleared him of what they said. Wait, who, who cleared him of what they said? It was Allah. And how was he cleared of having a scroll hernia? By making him run outside in front of men, women, and children, completely naked, stark naked, with his clothes on a stone that is being driven away from him. Who was driving that stone? Since it's a miraculous act, who was doing that? It was Allah, wasn't it, Sifi? And this verse itself says that Allah himself cleared him of what they said. So, uh, yeah. I mean, again, remember, Sifi, I think, woke up on the wrong side of the bed and said that Allah cannot command immoral things. Therefore, if you attribute it to Allah, then... That's wrong somehow. Okay. Well, Allah says here in the very verse you quoted that he was the one who cleared Moses of doing this by making the rock take his clothes and run away, leading him to expose himself publicly to men, women, and children to clear him of the accusation of having a scrotal hernia. So by your own, you see how your own standards fail you there? But again, I don't see an issue with that because I properly understand the nature of God as being omnibenevolent and omniscient. But for you, you seem to have missed this point. I think you need to to look up more on that. Number two, Moses alayhi salam ran away after the stone to get his clothes back, which is something normal to do. You cannot describe a man running naked through Bani Israel in front of men, women, and children as a normal thing, let alone if you're running after a stone with your clothes on it because your stone is magically or miraculously running away from you. That's not normal, Sifi. <laughs> No one will describe that as... Muslims won't describe that as normal, Sifi. Why are you describing it as normal? Oh, man, you're... you're you made me laugh, man. It's, it's good. Number three, Moses alayhi salam didn't know he would encounter anybody while trying to get his clothes back. Moses didn't know that as he's running after a stone naked outside in public that he would encounter anybody. Yeah. Sure thing, bro. You know, sometimes I just feel the need to run outside naked, and I naturally assume that I won't encounter anybody outside. Why would I? It's not as if I live in civilization and a society where people live and people go outside. <laughs> so obviously that's just silly. <laughs> no one would expect to see. <sighs> Can you imagine, like, 
some guy walking naked down the street and the police stop him and they say, why are you walking naked down the street? And he says, well, I didn't reasonably assume that I would see people outside. I didn't have that. I didn't. I just didn't think I would encounter anybody. Gosh, what are the odds that I was walking down this very heavily populated area and I would just so happen to encounter people from my own tribe? <laughs> Who would have thought? Number four, there is nothing in this hadith that decreases in the status of Musa alayhi salam or his honor. So his point that nothing in the hadith decreases the status of Musa or his honor. You, you need to do some loop-de-loops for this. If you think that Moses being publicly exposed naked in front of many people that would have included men, women, and children while chasing after a rock that has stolen his own clothes. It sounds like something out of a comedy sketch. And you're trying to say this isn't going to degrade his honor. Yes, it does. If I showed people on the street this hadith, they'd find it funny. You understand that? Come on, you, you even know it's funny. Sifi, you, you probably had a bit of a chuckle reading this as well, just like I did. We both know this is comedy gold. This is the stuff that sitcoms are made out of, Sifi. Anyway, narrated Jabir bin Abdullah. While Allah's messenger was carrying stones, along with the people of Mecca for the building of the Kaaba, wearing an Izzah, a way sheet cover, his uncle Alaba said to him, O oh my nephew, it would be better if you take off your Izzah and put it over your shoulders underneath the stones. So he took off his Izzah and put it over his shoulders, but he felt unconscious, and since then he had never been seen naked. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, there were points in Muhammad's life when he was publicly seen naked by many people. Again, this is a public event. Let me remind you that this is not a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not God Almighty who instructed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to take off his izar. It was his uncle Al-Abbas radiallahu anhu. And this event was before Islam. It was before Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became a prophet of God. Ah uh, yes, the whole it doesn't matter if it was before Islam. I don't even know why people bring this up. <laughs> So Muhammad could be like partying every night, you know, going to raves in, in the city that was Mecca. Uh, no, no, he couldn't have been. That's, that's like saying, that's like saying whenever someone t turns to God in repentance, they could never, they never did anything wrong before that. Even if they lived a life full of sin before that, somehow it just magically disappears and we rewrite history and we say, actually, they never did sin. They were perfect. Obviously not, Sifi. Come on. Like, if people do bad things, they are a sinner. There, there's no way you can gloss this over and start making these weird distinctions that don't come from your own book or your own material, like the Sunnah. Let's keep reading. Or keep watching. His uncle Al-Abbas said to him, Oh my nephew, it would be better if you take off your Izar and put it over your shoulders underneath the stones. First of all, the statement of Al-Abbas radiallahu anhu was between him and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And you can't prove to us that it was in the Kaaba in front of other people. He says that when Muhammad was naked because he took his Izar off and then fell unconscious and then since then he had never been seen naked according to the Hadith. He says that it's just between him and his uncle. No one else saw this. No one else saw this. Okay, but the the hadith starts by saying he was carrying stones along with the people of Mecca. There's multiple people here and he's carrying stones with them. If you're carrying stones with people of Mecca and you're at the Kaaba, a pretty public place, and you're like, whoa, I'm going to take my Izar off, wrap it around my shoulder and whoa, I feel, I feel I'm going a bit dizzy and you become unconscious. Pretty sure people around you who are carrying stones are going to notice. <laughs> what, did, what did his uncle jump on him or something like to hide him? Come on. This is, this is silly and um, immature. It's very immature. You should just accept what your sources say and stop trying to innovate on them to make yourself feel less embarrassed. And without realizing it, you just prove that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a true prophet because this was a miracle. Let's simplify this hadith. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was helping in building the Kaaba. When he was with his uncle, he advised him to take off his Izar. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam still didn't receive revelation and wasn't sent as a prophet at this time and tried to obey his uncle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him by causing him to faint so that he is protected from being exposed to others. So this is my brothers and sisters is a miracle and prove that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is a true prophet. Ah, it's a miracle. I should have known this was just another miracle. If your standard for a miracle is this low, I, uh, I don't know what to do. Um, I mean, Muhammad even says in the Quran that he was only sent as a warner. You know, I mean, come on, Sufi, stop trying to add to your religion. 
It's not, it's not helping. It just makes you look not so good. Not so good. Let's watch this next clip where Sifi addresses the whole Adam is 60 cubits. He is absolutely massive at 27 meters tall. And somehow from then, everyone has been getting smaller to this day, according to the Hadith. Let's see what he says about this. Humanity has not been decreasing in size since the time of Adam. Humanity has been increasing in size. We know from science, basic observation. I mean, it's not even, it's not even controversial that... A person's diet is one of the largest contributing factors to their size. And we also know, according to science, that we have a common ancestor with apes. Do you believe in this as well? You can't just pick and choose with scientific theories as you please. Trying to use science to refute Islam as a believer doesn't make any sense. Because we both believe in things that go against science. Like miracles, the creation of Adam السلام, and the soul. But again, let's use the same science he loves to respect respond to his claim. According to the Australian Museum, how have we changed since our species first appeared? We have undergone change since our species first evolved. Some changes were universal, whereas others were more regional in effect. The changes apparent in worldwide populations include a decrease in both overall body size and brain size as well as a reduction in jaw and tooth proportions. Regional populations have also evolved different physical and genetic characteristic in response to varying climates and lifestyles. So this article completely refutes your so-called argument that human beings aren't decreasing in size. But as a believer, I do not care what science or scientists have to say. I hear and obey whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say. Science is inferior to the revelation of God according to us Muslims. I don't know about you, but I assume Christians should also put the Bible first. What I find weird is again you're 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 being too minded here, Sifi. You're saying on the one hand we don't accept science, we accept the revelation of the Quran as final. Science cannot interact with this or overrule it in any sense. And in the next hand, you try to give justification of the Quran from science. So what is it? Should I listen to the science you're giving, or should I listen to the Quran and the Sunnah? I don't know. It seems like you're not really sure which one I should be listening to here. You then quoted. Wait, what? Let's have a look. The Australian Museum Research Institute. Really nice stuff. I like this. The issue is, though, is that the quote you gave said nothing about human beings being 27 meters tall or decreasing in size ever since then. I mean, to be honest with you, Sifi, I think they're talking in the level of inches uh, or centimeters or millimeters, not in terms of entire meters. I could be wrong, though. Uh, maybe get pick up the phone, give the Australian Museum Research Institute a call uh, and ask them whether or not they believe that human beings were 27 meters tall at one point. I have a funny feeling, Sifi. They would tell you no. Yet somehow you quote this as an authoritative source. Come on, Sifi. That's that's not good, right? You know you know that's being deceptive. You know full well they don't believe that. I mean, I, I can't believe you, you would have missed that. They're talking about minor changes. You're advocating for massive 27 meter tall changes. Bit of a difference there. And finally, let's look at his critique of the hadith I gave in which it said that Solomon had sexual relations with either 99 or 100 women in a single night. And then, because he didn't say inshallah, he, they only gave birth, or at least one of them only gave birth to a half man, as the hadith says. Let's watch this. In Sahih al-Bukhari 2819, we read, narrated Abu Huraira. Allah's messenger said, once Solomon, son of David, said, by Allah, tonight I will have sexual intercourse with 100 or 99, we're not quite sure, there's of a debate, women, each of whom will give birth to a knight who will fight in Allah's cause. And that's a, if Allah wills, but he did not say Allah willing. Therefore, only one of those women conceived and gave birth to a half man. By him in whose hands Muhammad's life is, if he had said Allah willing, he would have begotten sons, all of whom would have been knights striving in Allah's cause. So the son of David, Solomon, according to this hadith, which again is incredibly authentic, it's in the most trusted sources of hadith. He said he was going to have sex with 99 or 100 different women. The plausibility of this is immediately in question, but hey, let's go with it. I don't know what you're talking about. For some reason, Christians sometimes act like atheists when trying to speak against Islam. Are you trying to claim that miracles aren't plausible? What about raising people back to life? I believe this is way more miraculous than sleeping with 100 women. And you have no problem accepting it as a miracle of Jesus alayhis But let's read your Bible and see what it has to say about Solomon and women. 
1 Kings 11 verse 1 to 3. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had taught the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them, because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. So according to the Bible, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So in total, Solomon according to the Bible had 1000 women. So if you have a problem with having multiple women, start with your own Bible first. And yeah, the, the Bible verse you quoted, Sophie, didn't say that Solomon had sex with a thousand women or even a hundred or ninety-nine women in one night. Your hadith does. That is my critique of it. Now, Sifi does make a good point. He talks about discrimination of those with disabilities. And I do agree with him here. I think this hadith is actually quite discriminatory towards those with disabilities. It's basically saying that it's better to be a fully abled person who can fight in jihad for Allah's cause than it would be to be a, as the hadith uses the terms, half man. I do think that is also morally bad. So it's a good point, Sifi. But we'll leave that for this video. I'd love to see how he responds to this. It would obviously bring a lot new, a lot of new stuff that I can go through and hopefully Sifi learns some things as well. But thank you for your video, Sifi. I, of course, encourage you to repent from these things. Repent from the false prophet Muhammad and instead embrace the true prophet of Jesus, or as you call him, Isa, who loves you and has always loved you eternally, even though you are a disbeliever of him. And to come to Christ where there is no compulsion in religion and we have the historical truth about the prophets God bless you all. Take care, Sifi. Have a great day.